privacy, in particular protecting privacy, is tough, as you all well know. It's tough technologically, it's tough socially, and it's tough legally. And it won't come as a surprise to anybody in the audience to hear that we at Google have had our challenges over the years. We've, we've made our mistakes. We launched Google Buzz without designing it as well as we could have. We launched Street View in some countries which where it got a mixed reception. And we collected Wi-Fi data by mistake. That said, we live in Silicon Valley. We pride ourselves on the ability to learn from mistakes, to launch and iterate, and to get things right eventually. I'm happy to be here at IAPP to discuss some of the things we've learned over the years, to talk about the intersection between the information revolution and privacy, and to share some perspectives on how government policy can help us get it right. We at Google have had to evolve our, our attitude and our approach on privacy issues, particularly in Europe. We've needed to do a better job of listening to and understanding concerns raised by data protection authorities and others. We're now engaging with European regulators to improve our compliance with European data protection laws. And I think it's fair to say that we have put in more work than any other company out there in meeting these sometimes challenging legal requirements. I hope that our, our implementation of the recently decided right to be forgotten decision in Europe shows that we are, are willing to adjust our course when it comes to privacy. The Casteja ruling established that search is subject to European data protection law and broadly outlined various obligations regarding the removal of links in search. We've been working hard to implement the decision. Uh, some of the decisions are, are easy. Some of them are very difficult as we weigh the balance between privacy rights and the public's right to know. Our approach has largely been consistent with the recommendations of European experts and regulators, but there's still disagreement around the scope of issues like whether the scope of removals should be global or focused on Europe. Conflicts of law and jurisdiction are never easy, since the fundamental rights at stake are sometimes weighed differently in different countries and different parts of the world. But despite these differences, we have some big reasons to get this, to get privacy right. There's no way around the fact that data analysis, what we call smart data, is a key driver of today's economy and tomorrow's growth. Like light, data is a renewable and a non-rivalrous resource. Using it well fuels innovation in all parts of the economy. Of course, data comes from many sources. Some data is pre-existing, what's in our genes, our bodies, our environment. The world has always been full of such facts. And some data we create ourselves through a whole new world of computerized transactions and the growing world of the Internet of Things. It's important to step back and remember that until the year 2000, mankind had created and stored roughly 12 exabytes of data in total. An exabyte is a lot. It's roughly the amount of information in the US Library of Congress. So 12 exabytes in human history up to 12, 2000. Today, the world creates and stores roughly two exabytes of data every single day. 90% of the data in the world has been created in the last two years alone. That's 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day. The way to think about that is creating a new Google every four days. And the rate is increasing. In just one example, YouTube users upload hundreds of hours of video every minute. In total, that's more than all cinema, all TV, all home movies ever made. Believe it or not, the data, the facts alone, aren't really the interesting part. There have always been lots of facts in the world. Raw data is to knowledge what sand is to silicon chips. Data without insight is pretty worthless. It's data used well smart data that lets you build a bigger picture, a kind of integrated knowledge. 
we are just starting to unlock new troves of understanding with huge social value. And it's not just online companies reaping the benefits. It's small businesses selling more and wasting less. Consumers getting more of what they want faster. Universities and research hospitals revolutionizing healthcare through genetics, diagnostics, personalized medicine. And maybe most importantly, poor people around the world being included in a global trading and information economy with an unprecedented billion human beings coming out of extreme poverty in the last 30 years. That is unprecedented in the history of mankind. We are also seeing data-driven innovation in our daily lives. Personalized learning gives real-time feedback and assessments to help with student proficiency. De-identified data sets from hospitals are helping improve healthcare efficiency and outcomes. Data about the location of assaults is facilitating targeted interventions to reduce violent crime. So let me stress our deep belief that data-driven innovation is compatible with privacy. In fact, the two must go together. There's a path to data security and access control, reasonable user awareness and empowerment, data portability that will let us achieve both privacy and innovation. Of course, overly rigid restrictions on combining and repurposing data, strict prohibitions on data transfer, or overly detailed consent requirements could create challenges for the growth of data-driven innovation. Blanket prohibitions on data collection and transfer necessarily limit innovation. It's the misuse of data, not its collection per se, that should concern us most. Of course, in arguing for an approach focused on avoiding harms, we are required to also face up to the need to keep collected data safe and secure, so as to avoid the harms that can flow from data breaches and unlawful access. So how do we see those challenges at Google? How do we meet privacy and security expectations of users around the world? Complying with law is obviously a baseline requirement, and we're working hard to make sure we get it right. Beyond that, however, we also have to contend with the simple fact that privacy means different things to different people in different situations and in different cultures. There's simply no one-size-fits-all solution or easy answer here. That's why we work hard to put the user in control. People want to be in control of the information they share and want to have choices about the services they use. That takes a lot of engineering work. Privacy by design, not just in the creation of new products, but in the operation of your daily business. A few examples. First, user controls. Our user dashboard lets you see the information stored by Google and access all your privacy settings from one place. You can see the people you have shared documents with, the apps you've downloaded to your phone, and much more. People are using these tools and understanding the choices they're making. 10 million people check out their account history settings each week, and they make roughly 2.5 million changes to those settings, roughly evenly split between people turning on settings and turning off settings. Keeping a record of what you search for can improve the quality of some results. But if you want to search without your queries being stored, turn off search history. It's just that easy. Knowing your location helps us give directions without having, you having to type in your current location. That's great for people like me who have a hard time typing on small screens. But you can always turn off location as well. We take pride in letting people leave Google easily. It's a little counterintuitive, but we think it's the right thing to do. And in the long term, builds trust and quality of our services. Data portability matters. So we built Data Takeout, a tool that lets you export and remove data stored by Google and import it to another service. We want people using our services because we, they love them, not because we somehow hold their data hostage. Now, I also want to stress the importance of security. I know this is a privacy conference, but I also know that this audience understands better than perhaps anyone that data privacy and data security are not at odds with each other. They're two sides of the same coin. You can't have privacy without security. Your data just isn't private if it isn't secure. 
We can see too easily what happens to privacy when security fails. The celebrity hacks of late last year are a clear example of the risks. People using the iCloud service were victimized, likely through a sophisticated phishing or malware attack. And consumers are clearly worried about breaches. A recent poll in the US showed that more people were concerned about being hacked than about having their house robbed. The FTC once again found last year that identity theft, a typical outcome when data security goes wrong, was the leading consumer complaint in 2014 for the 15th consecutive year. That's why we invest so heavily in strong account protections and encourage others to focus more on this area. Anti-hijacking systems have reduced the number of compromised Google accounts by more than 99% since we introduced them in 2011 by blocking sufficient, uh, suspicious login attempts. If you've ever traveled to a new place and got a Gmail about a recent login, that's our system at work. We were one of the first companies to offer the additional protection of two-factor authentication across our accounts. Even if a hacker has your password, he or she likely doesn't have your phone or security key, so getting into your account becomes much harder. Our safe browsing technology scours the web for sites that try to steal passwords or contain malware. You may have seen one of the very visible warnings we show when someone tries to navigate to a malware, a malicious page, and you're not alone. We're currently showing 20 million warnings per week. We make this data freely available to the public and other companies, and since both Apple's Safari and Mozilla's Firefox browsers use it, taken together, we help protect 1.1 billion people around the world from attacks. We also stop all ads pointing to sites where we find malware. Last year alone, we removed more than 250,000 sites from our ad network for hiding different kinds of malware. But the internet, interconnected nature of the web means that security is not just something one company can do by itself. Vulnerabilities of one system can create a launching pad for attacks on others. That's why we're working to improve the state of the web ecosystem writ large. For example, in an effort to engage other sites to use encryption, we now rank encrypted websites slightly higher in our search results. Also, I know you've been hearing a lot about encryption. At Google, we've significantly expanded our use of encryption, which helps safeguard fundamental human rights like privacy and free expression. Encryption requires governments, including the US government, to go through proper legal channels to request the data they need for an investigation rather than relying on mass surveillance. Google was the first email service to be encrypted by default, and Google Search, Drive, and Maps are all encrypted. We've encrypted data moving internally between our servers, a project we accelerated in the wake of the Snowden revelations, and we're working to extend encryption to more of our services every day. Of course, the private sector can't do it alone. Governments have a responsibility to protect their citizens and an often pressing need to, rev to review private communications in the course of investigating crimes. Make no mistake, we recognize that we have a legal and moral responsibility to protect the privacy and security of our users' data. At the same time, we want to be responsible in helping governments keeping people safe. We're committed to both goals. So we work with governments in ways that are accountable and transparent. Governments on both sides of the Atlantic are suggesting that they need access to encryption keys or other forms of backdoor access to user information. In our view, encryption doesn't just protect against bad guys. It directs governments toward the, the front door using established legal process. So we need to make the front door work better, not build backdoors. It's always been true that technology can be used, used for good or for bad. Ever since people discovered fire, there's been arson. But since most people, the overwhelming majority of people, use the internet for good and legitimate ways, we shouldn't weaken security and privacy protections for the majority to deal with the minority who don't. That's why in both emergency and non-emergency situations, we review every single data request that comes through our door to ensure that they comply with the law and are not overbroad. Our transparency report uh, that we were the first to publish shows that we are often pushing back on requests that we receive. That's also why in non-emergency situations, data requests, especially for private communications like Gmail, must always come through appropriate channels like mutual legal assistance treaties, MLATs, which create processes for one government to 
to request data stored by a company from another country. Still, the MLAP process is too slow, too complicated, and in need of reform. For example, it would save everyone time if we moved beyond fax machines and diplomatic pouches, red wax and sealing ribbons, to web forms that are quick and easy to process. Europe is leading the way here, and we now need the US government to follow suit. And it's time for governments to step to consider changes to international agreements that would make data access contingent on the physical location of the person rather than the location of the data. Improving the legal channels for governments to obtain data is very different than permitting mass surveillance. PRISM and other programs that were recently revealed were damaging for the entire internet ecosystem and for the US government's relationship with Europe and other regions of the world. We don't want technology companies mistakenly viewing, viewed as doing mass surveillance. That is just not the case. But the revelation sparked a very important debate about privacy and security in the context of government surveillance. We need to find a reasonable middle ground as we pro progress that debate, one that restricts indiscriminate surveillance and aids valid law enforcement efforts while also protecting people's privacy and keeping their data secure. We need surveillance reform, including ECPO reform in the United States. We need encryption, and we need better mechanisms for sharing data between governments for legitimate law enforcement purposes. And as we continue to press for surveillance reform, it's also crucial, crucial that we continue to support the successful revision of the US-EU Safe Harbor Agreement and other international agreements that facilitate data flows. The Safe Harbor Agreement and Apex cross-border privacy rules provide for the legitimate transfer of data in the cloud. These programs help not just for big upstarts, but for small upstarts as well. They facilitate interoperability, solve applicable law conflicts, and give countries, sorry, companies, an operating baseline by setting the standards for the transfer and protection of personal data. These kinds of sustainable tra transfer models are critical to cross-border data flows and to the worldwide, increasingly data-driven economy. Finally, I'd like to say a few words about the recent White House draft privacy bill. The US has demonstrated in this past week that it continues to work on developing legislation that strikes the right balance between protecting the rights of consumers and allowing for data innovation. We applaud the efforts of the administration for kicking this off and for making it clear that this is a discussion draft. Figuring out the details will be difficult. It's encouraging that the administration is welcoming an active discussion to improve on what they've put forth. It's time for people to start considering how the details of this bill or any bill would work in practical terms. Do they effectively address privacy risks and real harms? Do they promote the kinds of transformative, data-driven innovation that we've been discussing today? As I noted at the outset, privacy protection is one of the most difficult and important social, technological, and legal challenges we face today. We've learned from experience it can be hard to apply privacy protections when privacy can mean so many different things to different people in different contexts. That's why we put users in the driver's seat through settings and controls, portability, and security. We're working hard to apply sometimes challenging legal requirements working hard to make the web a safer place for everyone, not just our users, and working hard for surveillance reform and progress on data transfer rules. The bottom line is that people around the world are benefiting from smarter uses of data to solve problems big and small. It has never been more critical that all of us, individuals, companies, and governments, remain committed to solving these problems and to getting privacy and security right. We work, look forward to working with all of you toward that goal. Thank you very much.